Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Happiness Quest. My name is Jess Dutel from the Office of Community Impact at Plymouth State University. And I'm Dr. Maria Sanders, a philosophy professor at Plymouth State University and CEO on Philosophy for Life. And today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Mr. Gabe Morris. Uh, Gabe is a senior at Plymouth State University. Uh, he's majoring in philosophy, uh, but today he joins us to share his latest piece of artwork. And this is the first in a series of three shows that uh, students will be showing their signature work projects. Uh, they, in their senior year, there's a new course at Plymouth State University where students can develop, create, and implement a project of their choice. And this particular course has a theme of life, liberty, and the pursuit of Tao. So we played off of the pursuit of mm -hmm. happiness and figured it would be perfect to have them come on the show and take a look at how a lot of the happiness research we've been discussing directly applies to the projects that the senior students are creating. So welcome to the program. Welcome. Thanks for having We're me. So excited yes, that you're here, I'm very excited to be here. So you're a major in philosophy, but you're actually a philosopher artist. That uh, is true, yeah. I, so uh, how did you become interested in art? Well, I mean, it happened in high school. Um, I remember I was 15 years old and um, someone who I was spending a lot of time with asked me to paint with them. Uh, it kind of started off as a hobby and my high school art teacher, Val Kropnicki, um, he influenced me a lot. Mm. Also my older brother, Carlin Morris, who um, currently has his BFA in sculpting from the University of Hartford. He influenced me a lot. So your brother's so, an artist too. Oh yeah, he was um, the artist before I was and he actually, he won a silver key some national award mm -hmm. for his uh, senior portfolio in high school. So I remember wow. that was a big deal and um, very influential. And uh, along with Val Kropp and Nikki, I just, you know, I took off as a painter. And um, yeah, it was, it was hard for me not to go to art school, but I decided to try philosophy instead. So. so how did you become interested in philosophy? I know that's not typically a discipline offered <laughs> at the high school level. That's a very good question. <laughs> So it absolutely wasn't. Um, I didn't have any philosophical background before Plymouth State and meeting Dr. Sanders. But um, the first time I thought about it, I was sitting with my advisor in high school um, and he kind of jokingly said, well, Gabe, if you want to take philosophy in college, you might as well learn how to spell it correctly. <laughs> so I That's learned how to spell step, it. Gabe. Yeah, <laughs> and I haven't messed up since. And um, he kind of told me not to do it, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. It was a little discouraging, but then, you know, I, I came to PSU and my first class was building a civil society with Dr. Mm -hmm. Sanders. Uh, I went up to her after the first class and I told her I was interested in philosophy. She said, Gabe, here's a pin number. You're taking intro to logic. I'm your advisor. <laughs> Let's do it. And uh, four that years later. Like you, Maria. Yeah, we yeah. were off and running by that point. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, yeah, I look back, I'm very thankful for that being my first class mm -hmm. and uh, just having the nerve to go up and say something about my, uh, my interest in mm -hmm. philosophy. And uh, I'm really glad I'm where I'm at. Yeah. This so. is so interesting. Is it okay to ask how does your art inform your interpretation of philosophy mm -hmm. and how does philosophy inform your art? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking about that because I was ready for this question. And um, my response is going to be that art and philosophy, it's really no different, right? It's all just an expression of ideas, right? Whether that is uh, in the form of a dialogue or whether that is an acrylic abstract self-portrait, I feel like I'm expressing myself philosophically you know, and equally. So there's really no difference for me. And as I grow as a philosopher, I grow as an artist. And as I grow as an artist, I grow as a philosopher. Which is why I've always thought of him as a philosopher artist, because they're yeah. intertwined uh, in how he views them. I did want to go back to something you said, though, um, because I think it's very common for both parents, teachers, uh, well-intended adults to talk high schoolers out of majoring in philosophy. Mm -hmm. You've gone through the philosophy program, you're getting ready to graduate now, starting to look, look at that next level. Okay, yeah. what am I gonna do with my degree? You know, the, the scary real world out mm. there. Yes, absolutely. Do you regret majoring in philosophy? What would you recommend 
to other high school students that might be considering it, but are also being discouraged by others? Well, I would recommend that if you're going to major in philosophy in college, um, do it for the right reasons. And that sounds pretty far-fetched, I'll explain it for you. See, college, the typical view of college is to go and get a job and to uh, create some sort of financial stability in the future. Um, when I started philosophy, uh, Dr. Sanders kind of explained this to me early on that, you know, academia is all about this journey to create like the highest intellect that you are capable of and, um, you know, just to keep growing. And it's not about a job and it's not about what you do with it. It's more about growing intellectually. And uh, I think that something like a job in the future will fall into place if I uh, stay passionate and if I focus on being philosophical, someone will appreciate it eventually. So you just, you have to have faith in intellect and you have to have faith in the world around you because obviously it doesn't matter, you know, how intellectual you are if no one appreciates it. So I think uh, a lot of people are discouraged when they realize you know, philosophy is amazing, but if no one's around to appreciate it, what's the point? Um, it's understandable to think th that way, but uh, you have to force yourself not to because, you know, the world isn't going to move at the same mm -hmm. speed that you do. I you think know? that's so important, and I mm -hmm. think for me at least, education is really about a journey of self-discovery. Absolutely. And um, sometimes I think society tends to view higher ed as a means to an end, as mm -hmm. a means to get the job, to get the money. But yet when you view it as this personal journey of self-discovery, you have the opportunity to really explore what interests you, what lights you up, what your passions are. And when you find that path, the job, like you said, uh, has a way of finding you. And then, you know, when you are engaged in the type of work that creates a lot of meaning in your life, the money just flows in because money is just flow of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're focused on work that lights you up and that makes your heart sing, all the other things fall into place. But in a sense, when we buy into this idea that higher ed is just for obtaining a job, we kind of like put the cart before the horse, I think. Well, and it's a bit short-sighted. Absolutely. I mean, you definitely miss a lot of opportunities at the higher ed level. Um, I look at it, it's something that's really been in development for, I would say, about two decades now, mm -hmm. um, this corporatization yes. of higher ed, uh, looking at higher education as if it's a business. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now again, I'll be the first one to admit there are definitely business-like variables and business features mm -hmm. uh, to running a college. Um, and one of my degrees is in business. Yes. One of your degrees is in business. So we understand the business side of sure. it. But I always cringe a little bit when I hear higher ed compared to a business or when students are directed to pick majors simply to get a job. Now again, mm -hmm. without sounding idealistic, we're in a consumer-based capitalistic society. Uh, you're gonna need to get a job. <laughs> there yeah. needs to be yeah. a money flow. Absolutely. So there's yeah. a practical side to it. But if that's all we're focused on, we really don't need mm. these universities. No. Vo vocational yeah. schools will take care of that. Mm. Right. Um, you can probably get the training you need in about a year. You know, mm -hmm. So if you're really gonna fully embrace higher ed, it's about developing the person, yes. um, the mind, the body, the spirit, all of it. Mm. And if we think about where college and the whole idea of university grew out of, it's really Plato's Academy. Right, I would like to say something about that. Um, I did a project last semester uh, comparing Plymouth State University to Plato's Academy. And I think it was really eye-opening just looking at the facts. Um, for those of you that don't know, you could go to Plato's Academy for as long as you wanted um, you didn't have to pay for the time that he was ruling the, the academy. I was going to ask how much did it cost. <laughs> right, yeah, it didn't cost a thing. Mm -hmm. And that is how, you know, these universities should really be set up is, you know, no money and then there's no time limit. You're just, you're there to mm -hmm. learn and you're there to grow intellectually, go on some sort well, of journey. Well, we put so much emphasis on the destination right mm -hmm. instead of really embracing the journey and mm -hmm. that's really what life is well and a lot of the secondary things the academy if you were a student at the academy it would also be a completely different experience mm -hmm. than 
a student at a university today. You're yeah. not going to have these air conditioned, technology driven rooms. There's, it's going to be focused on mm -hmm. the content. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a, what I would consider to be like a mentoring situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and people were there because they wanted to be there. So I've spoken about Aristotle many times on the show. Aristotle was Plato's student. Mm -hmm. Aristotle went to the academy. Aristotle was there for 30 years mm -hmm. because there he didn't. no time for right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's where he wanted to mm -hmm. be. Uh, and so we look back and say, well, how did they survive? They also need to put food on the table. Sure. They, so there are different models out there. Um, and as we think about our current situation with higher ed, we definitely know the cost is completely out of control. So student as we debt is oh, student continuing debt. to increase. I yeah. have now my third child is about to go off to college, so I'm really aware of it. <laughs> but there I'm only are four four <laughs> short years away. Oh, it'll come around very quickly. Yeah. But there's a there are yeah. a lot of different sort of models yep. that um, we could still maximize the intellectual mm -hmm. side without having that high high debt for right. students. But let's come back to the signature work okay. course. Mm -hmm. uh, this was. Uh, basically a pilot this year um, where Plymouth State University is focusing on skills mm -hmm. and as you were talking about being a philosophy major in philosophy we focused on skills uh, mm -hmm. for probably about the last century um, because we don't have a direct track to one job mm -hmm. and so what a philosophy degree gets you is a lot of practice in ethical bandering back and forth, uh, practice with critical thinking skills, practice oh, yeah. with creative communication. thinking, Tons, yeah. communication. So the wisdom of this now is also trickling into other disciplines and what we're realizing is in today's job market, uh, the jobs are changing so quickly mm -hmm. and technology itself, which is tied now to practically every job out there, is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And so to do well, not just land the job, but get those promotions and progress um, within your place of employment, students need to be flexible. And they need to be able to think on their feet, um, both those creative and critical thinking skills. So this course is intended to be a bookend. If you think of two bookends for uh, a student's four years at the university, they would come in their freshman year and take freshman year seminar where habits of mind, mm -hmm. uh, like open and effective communication being one example, would be introduced. They would do a project, but at kind of a, a, a lower level, maybe the impact would be on campus. Mm -hmm. They would take then four years worth of classes, both in general education and in their major, and then take this capstone gen ed course, which is the signature work course. So although there are a lot of different themes, they're not all focused on happiness, like mm -hmm. our theme is, um, what is similar is students their junior or senior year will be able to develop projects and have an impact ideally both on and off campus. And so in your signature work course, again, the theme was life, liberty, and pursuit of Tao. Right. So we studied a little bit about Taoism, a mm -hmm. couple weeks, not long. And then each student was challenged to develop their own project. So can you tell us a little bit about the project you developed? Absolutely. Um, so this all goes back to my high school art career. Uh, I developed this method in which I would take a specific date, right? Uh, a birthday kind of comes to mind. And I would take all those numbers and uh, turn them into shapes. And then I would overlap these shapes, right? And uh, in return, you get this almost like a 3D sculpture of sorts. I mean, obviously a painting is 2D, but it creates the illusion. And um, in the past I have made um, sculptures based on the formula and created the 3D skeleton of some paintings. Mm, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's a neat idea. So yeah. I, I really like this idea. I've kind of put it away as an artist and I've tried a lot of new creative methods in my time. Um, but. I thought the signature project would be a perfect opportunity to take this method back and uh, incorporate it with my philosophy. So how I did this was um, I requested to interview a random stranger and I wanted to learn about him have or her have about you know a one hour interview and uh, not just ask philosophical questions but really just learn about who this person is right because I want to reflect that with my painting. And so I did this. I had an awesome interview with um, a, a nice young man named Jameson. And um, 
it was really eye-opening. And then I took his birth date and I created a um, abstract self-portrait with the shapes that came from the numbers from his birth wow. date. And I uh, represented the colors and some of the other mediums on the um, canvas. I had it represent the things that I learned from the interview. So. And how long did it take from the time you met with your subject to a finished piece of artwork? Well, it took, this time it took two weeks. Um, mm. I mean, it varies, definitely varies. Uh, like if I'm doing something with what I was talking about before, my new creative methods, you know, some of my paintings take like 10 minutes. And um, there is a category of my paintings that are the, you know, in my opinion, the best I've ever made that have come from, you know, 10 five minute sessions. Wow. But I do have, you know, this method, which is mm -hmm. really complex. And it definitely takes at least a week just to get the skeleton down. And uh, it's really important to add a lot of layers with these paintings to give that 3D effect. So it sounds like there's a difference when you're in the creative flow and it might kick out in 10 minutes versus as an intellectual level. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Did Jameson get an opportunity to see this piece? And if so, what was the reaction there? Well, I'm really excited to show him. Okay. I've, I've been trying to he keep it, it under the radar, yeah. Uh, and this sure. won't air before, so he's oh, gonna well, see good. it tomorrow. Yeah, we have yeah. some plans. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to uh, do a little write-up for him too and explain the, uh, you know, the birthday and how it was transformed into this object. And uh, But you have used this method in the past, so what is typically the reaction when someone sees the piece? Well, most of um, my date paintings in the past have kind of been centered around me. Oh, so, so this is the first time this is pushing with out a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, I mean, I've done this, you know, revolved around specific dates that me and a certain person will share. Mm -hmm. Like uh, me and a significant other, if we really liked a certain date, maybe back in high school, I might have made a few paintings. But it was always revolved around my life. And um, yeah, meeting a complete stranger was really important because mm -hmm. I wanted to see what I could do with like a blank slate. Mm. So we're going to get a sneak wow, peek. I, I asked him to bring the piece of artwork. I see yeah. it over there in the corner. Yeah. Really so will you show it. us your artwork and maybe talk us through a little bit of the significance of the various pieces? Absolutely. So, okay. So Jameson's birthday, it had a 12 sided shape, which is right here. That's the head. You can see it uh, covered in orange. I could actually count it out if you want me to. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, then we have a nine sided shape. That's the blue. Um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a six sided shape. Three, uh, three sided shape, and then we have a one for a line segment. See, ones and twos can be line segments uh, because this was a, um, a 21, I believe. Okay. So I didn't want to make a 21 sided shape. However, there was a 12, so I can kind of make that judgment call if I want to do a 12 sided shape like I did here. Hmm. I can do that, or I could just do, you know, one line segment or two line segments. So that is his birth date in a nutshell, all just added up as these organic shapes that I, you know, that I created. You wouldn't find these shapes in a children's book, <laughs> which is kind of where you get these weird forms. Uh, Jameson really liked logic. Mm. So I took my notes from Intro to Logic freshman year and I put it in one of his eyes and uh, his eyebrow up here. I also, I have, um, I cut out a page from my logic textbook and I put that in the line segment. Mm. It's kind of a he represents maybe that he's grounded by logic or that he's under it, that he's trapped by it, or that it transcends his knowledge, however you want to take mm -hmm. it, right? Now, uh, right here we have notes about, this is actually Jameson's name right here. Uh, some of the first things that I picked up on him, we were actually both from Connecticut, so you know there's some sign of that, and then all of his hobbies are kind of in his cranium right here. But the most uh, important thing that I think Jameson's gonna have a lot of reaction from is this right here. And this says, push forward. Now, when I was interviewing Jameson, I, I was kind of, I really wanted to break through and just find out what was in his head that he wasn't telling me, right? So I switched over my notebook, I gave him the pen, and I just said, write down whatever comes to mind that you think you wanna get out, but you just can't get out. 
that, you know, that we haven't gone over yet, that a question won't get me to. Hmm. And uh, after a few minutes, he only wrote down two words, and it was uh, push forward, which I, th I thought it was beautiful, right? So I, um, I placed it right in the middle of the mouth. Yeah, and that's because that kind of represents what is inside of Jameson that he wants to get out that tends to be kept inside. Wow, I yeah. love that. I particularly like the logic in the mm. eye and then above it as well. It reminds me a mm. lot in uh, philosophy what we refer to as the mind's eye. Mm. So actually seeing it both through Absolutely, what we yeah. think of as our senses, the eye, but also the mind. It's, yeah, it's very fitting to be, you know, in the eye because that's where a lot of our logic is like first off processed. Obviously, it goes back into the reasoning in our brains, but the logic, you know, it always starts mm. off with her So, eyesight. color choice. Yeah. How do you decide what colors to use? Well, you know, Jameson was a really bright and nice and positive kid. So, it was... Uh, it was kind of hard because I wanted to put in all the colors. I mean, he really represented all the colors in the rainbow. You know, it wasn't like I met someone and I just thought matte black canvas <laughs> or I met him and he was just like, you know, pale egg white. You know, I, I, that's not what I got. It, it was, he was very vibrant and he was very expressive and he was very interested in philosophy, which I liked a lot. So that's why you see the logic notes up there. Uh, but yeah, all in all, I'd say he was calm, cool, and collected, so that's where you get the blues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the head's got a nice orange color. I don't really know why I did that. See, sometimes colors just happen, and um, that's one thing that has developed pretty far for me as an artist is the, the way in which I use colors and the way I see them. Uh, a lot of the reasoning behind the color for that painting is just because the balance was there and uh, one of the hardest things as an artist is to know when to stop right mm -hmm. so when mm -hmm. I see something that I think has good balance and that I'm relatively happy with I sit with it and uh, lo and behold sometimes it's a finished painting so that's a good point yeah. when to know that it's finished mm -hmm. because I can remember different uh, pieces of artwork when I'm working on whether it's painting or uh, could be other mediums Mm -hmm. It ends up just getting muddy if you yeah. go too long. Yeah. It's like you miss the yeah. finish point. I write poems, and people have asked me before, how do you know when you're done? So mm -hmm. every birthday that my children have, I write a poem about the past year. And that's a good question. How do I know when I'm done? But it's just this knowing. Mm -hmm. This Does this feel right? Right. And It's sense, the hardest part. It's hard, yeah. but it's a sense that this is complete. I feel whole about it, and this is what I'm ready to share with the yeah. world. I wonder... I mean, I'm really interested in meeting Jameson now because I wonder if in his presence the same kind of feelings would be invoked as sitting in the presence of this beautiful piece of artwork, right? Because as I'm hearing you talk about capturing his essence mm -hmm. and his truest nature and the colorfulness of his energy and what it's like to be with him, I wonder right. if I would get the same feeling. Well, and we were discussing something very similar when he was developing the mm -hmm. idea for this project. And so do you want to talk a little bit about what's coming next and how we're involving the existentialism class in this particular project as well? So which they don't know yet, by the way. <laughs> right, so um, we will be uh, bringing the painting into the class unannounced, and um, I'm pretty sure we're going to capture the reaction of everyone, mm -hmm. especially Jameson. And, uh, and I would hope that you will get the vibes. You know, that mm. is the goal right there. So, so that is your goal. Yeah, I mean, when I make something, uh, when I did this abstract self-portrait date method with myself, you know, mm -hmm. I see the, the painting and I see a mirror. And I wanted to give that gift to other people because obviously it's not a mirror, uh, but the colors and the shapes, I just felt like they really directly reflected who I was. And that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. to find something so abstract. It's a very powerful thing. To have it too. reflect you mm -hmm. so accurately. Mm -hmm. So if I can give that gift to people, you know, that would be amazing. Well, and I think there's something to be said for art appreciation. Uh, my older brother is an artist by trade, and he really started painting uh, pretty heavily in the fifth grade and has been continuing ever since. But I can remember, uh, especially when we were both in high school, he's less than a year older than me, and he would talk, well, 
I would prod him, <laughs> being the future <laughs> philosopher, as to what he was thinking and why he was doing things mm -hmm. the way he was. He kind of, I think, just wanted me out of the room so it was quiet and he He'd could finish doing what he's doing. To get rid of you. <laughs> right. But it always struck me then when I would go to his art shows mm -hmm. and listen to other people, especially um, individuals with degrees in art, and as they would talk about uh, his composition and the, obviously the message he's trying to relate, and they never got it right. I mean, mm. it was never even close to what he had in mind. Yeah. But of course, a lot of times he would just nod, you know, <laughs> yes, you know, spot on. Mm -hmm. And so at a very young age, I did learn that art appreciation, once you put it out there as an artist, in a way you're releasing it, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, and yeah. when I come to observe that art, I might get something very similar to what that artist intended. Mm -hmm. I may be so far away from what they intended because of what I'm bringing to that experience as well. And what the happiness research tells us is people literally uh, report a higher level of happiness just by viewing art mm -hmm. and all kinds of art. And it seems to be tied uh, to the release of dopamine in the brain, that mm -hmm. we release dopamine when we're viewing works of art, very similar to when we're exercising. Um, and so there is a direct correlation to our feelings of art and feelings of happiness. So what you're saying is I don't have to exercise, I can just look at art. That's, That's kind exactly of the what route I've saying. gone. <laughs> <laughs> just for the record, we're not advocating that. Maybe take a more holistic approach. If it's a big museum <laughs> and you walk, you know. So there you the go. Exactly. Right? Integrate both. both. There you I are. Well, I stumbled on, as I was preparing for this show, a new research study. And I'll be surprised if you've even heard of this one yet. But they've put out it the, um, uh, it's in England, uh, that McCarran, I'm looking for the name here. It's mm -hmm. McCarran is the uh, researcher's name. What he's done is he's created an iPhone app that randomly dings people mm -hmm. twice a day. And they are to take a short survey about their level of happiness and their level of alertness. Mm. And then he compares it to what activities they're doing at the time. And in the last three months, they had over 3 million data points from 45,000 users in the UK. Wow. Um, so it's beyond just England, it looks mm -hmm. like it's the whole United Kingdom. I, I'm sorry, I said I misspoke. I said three months, it's 18 months, over the last 18 months. So three million data points, 45,000 users. And the results that they found, they ranked the top six happiness-related activities. Uh, number one, I'm as you can probably guess, is sex. Uh, number two. I was going to say eating. But yeah, yeah. Sports, yeah. running, exercise. So any sort of physical exercise was okay, number two. Okay, I'll get out there and start jogging again. But here's the <laughs> really surprising part. The next four are all tied to the arts. Mm -hmm. So the third top activity was theater, dance, going to concerts. The fourth, singing and performing. The fifth, exhibitions, museums, libraries. And the sixth, hobbies, arts, mm -hmm. and crafts. Well, at first blush, it may be a little surprising, but then when you dig a little deeper, all of those activities really is about connecting. Connecting mm -hmm. inward to yourself, connecting with others. Yeah. You know, Releasing so emotions. Right. So that creative mm. flow. And this is where I think your project is of particular interest because you, you're getting the benefits that are typically associated with happiness and art, mm -hmm. but I think you're getting it at a deeper level because of the meeting you have with the subject, getting right. to know the subject, making that oh, yeah. personal, meaningful connection before you're even diving into the creative art mm -hmm. aspect of it. Right, well, you know, I mean, I've been making paintings, you know, to sit in my attic, basically, so, I. I would love to be a famous artist who could sell everything that I make. But I believe you are going to be. In fact, uh, yeah, I think this is, this is kind today. of the, the foundation here. You know, <laughs> That's great. I think but you're on to something. This is your big yeah, launch. Thank yeah. you. Take note. Right. So uh, I mean, I guess that kind of gets me to my next point: is um, in the future, you know, if anyone would like to contact me, I can do this for them and, and, and arrange a meeting so I could uh, have the same, you know, the same stuff happen for whoever wants it. Yeah. That's great. Kinda. Well, it looks like we're almost out of time. Mm, already, um, that went quickly. So oh, wow. let me close with just asking you very quickly, what advice would you give someone who, like a future artist that's considering uh, pursuing art and perhaps with this philosophical taint to it as a career? 
I would um, I would say that you know do art the way that you want to do it. Don't let any teacher tell you you're doing something wrong. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that your art is bad. Uh, we talked about art and how it makes you feel. The reality is, if your artwork makes anyone feel anything at all, and you know, that doesn't need to be happiness. I mean, they could be horrified, but as long as they feel something, you did your job. So. You know, as an artist, you just you have to have that drive to make someone feel something, and uh, just to never let anyone tell you that you're doing anything wrong. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've start I've tried new methods, you know, of creating, and I look back on my high school days and I can remember, uh, you know, direct quotes from my art teacher saying, "Don't do that. That's not the way you do it." And you know now I do things that I was told not to do, and I make amazing art based mm. off that. So, you know, there is no right and wrong way. You have to stay completely original. And in this sense, I'm almost glad I didn't go to art school because I know there would have been people out there who told me there was a right and wrong way. And there is a professional way to look at artwork, but there also is a natural way. And mm. I think the natural way will always produce the most original and moving artwork. So well said. So genuine yeah. art is good art. It's about standing in your truth. Thank yeah. you so much. Absolutely. Of course. Thank, thank you.